Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Three, two, one, and we are back, and this is day three. Three, mm-hmm. three yeah. And we're talking about negotiation secrets, tactics, and strategies for this new market. Without any further delay, Julie Harris, start with part three. Part number three is all about knowing the buyer. Day one, or part one, we talked about the house. The second part, we talked about the seller. So today, we're talking about what do you know about the buyer's priorities? Again, it's important to use these strategies, whether you're representing the buyer or the seller. Negotiating is a give and take, ending in an agreeable resolution known as a contract. The more (laughs) you know, the smoother your negotiation will be with less stress for you and your clients. Right. And by the way, this is uh, day three. So if you've not yet listened to day one and day two, uh, is awaiting for you over on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or of course our YouTube channel, along with, wait for it, 2,000 plus other podcasts. So make sure you guys are getting caught up on all of your real estate training and coaching needs. Point number one, Julie. Yes, point number one. This is part three. How interested is the buyer in this home? Well, on a scale of one to 10, 10 meaning they've got to have it no matter what, and one meaning they wouldn't care if somebody else bought it this evening. How would they rate their interest level? And it's okay for you to ask them that. Are you more motivated than they are? Or are they asking what it's going to take to buy the property? Now, that question should have been answered when you were originally pre-qualifying the buyer in the first place. In other words, when you were actually taking the temperature of that buyer when they originally showed up in your life and you're pre-qualifying them. And then you can ask the question again when you actually find them the house. But Here's the actual script in the buyer pre-qualifying thing, right? So Mr. S- Mr. Buyer, right? I'm going to say seller. It's just, you know, it's, Natural. it's hardwired, right? Mm-hmm. So Mr. Buyer, um, if I already, this is not the script. This is a question about three quarters of the way into the buyer pre-qual script. Mr. Buyer, so if I understand what you're looking for, you're looking for a you know, three-bedroom house up to 750 in this particular area, these particular amenities. So if I find this property and it is exactly what you've been looking for, it is the right condition, it is the right condition, uh, location rather, it has all the boxes checked, this is the home you'd been hoping for. And by the way, the seller has you know, got the right level of motivation, they're going to leave some, you know, the condition of the house is great. This again is the property you are hoping to find on a scale of one to 10, Mr. Buyer, where would you rate your motivation to purchase that house today? And then shut up and listen. Again, this is part of the buyer pre-qualifying script. And then what you'll discover is the buyer will give you an answer. And if they answer anything over other than a 10 or, you know, 11, 12, 13, right? Then you have to address that. Okay. So they're going to say, and this is what you'll hear a lot for the buyers that have other issues that are lingering that will prevent them from actually purchasing. But it's important that you find this out before you waste any time showing them properties. So you've said what I've said. Now you're going to say, so on a scale one to 10 with 10 being, you'd absolutely positively buy the house. Nothing would stand in your way. Where would you rate your motivation? And if they say a seven or an eight or a five, well, that's interesting. A seven. So what would it take to get you to a 10? Remember, you want to know this before you start working with them. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to discover what the other things are that they have to resolve prior to them actually becoming a buyer. But what most agents will do is they're going to get a buyer. The buyer can indeed fog a mirror. And you're then going to assume that that buyer is actually a real buyer because you don't know how to pre-qualify. You don't know how to pre-qualify them for financial uh, their ability to you know purchase the house, you, you need a good loan officer for that, and then you don't know how to pre-qualify them for motivation, and then you're going to waste an entire you know frankly maybe even year working with a bunch of unqualified folks. The first time you pre-qualify them is going to be when you're meeting with them the first time, usually over the phone and maybe in person too, and that also goes with sellers. The secondary time you're going to motivate them is using what Julie just said. So you're always going back to refocusing the buyer on what their motivation and their time frame is and the seller on what their time frame is. Now let's drill down on that. There's a difference between like when you ask a seller, Mr. Seller, do you absolutely have to sell this home or do you want to sell this home? 
Listen to what they say. If they say, well, we want to sell it if we can get the price or if all these other stars align, you need to then make a determination whether that's a viable seller or not, right? You have to adjust accordingly. If they're uh, aspirational price, i.e. overpriced, but not by an enormous amount, take the listing. If they're just unrealistic about what their time frame is and they're just not really motivated at all, well, you know, we're trying to get in contract on a new construction lot. And then if you find the right builder and you can build the house to the right price range, and then, you know, so you're going to waste your time. You're going to put, you're going to bring a buyer to that house. And then the seller is going to be impossible to negotiate with because they don't have to sell the house and they got no other place got to, nowhere go. to go. And right. you know, the other version of this, and I'm hearing this a ton right now is because, you know, it's winter in parts of the air, you know, of the world. The, it'll be a seller that says, well, you know, we've always wanted to move to Florida. Yeah. And that's the end of it. They haven't been looking in Florida. They don't have a lot in Florida. They've never seen builders in Florida. They've not looked at resale in Florida. They don't even have a Florida agent. And so if they get their price, well, maybe that'll motivate them to do something. And those sellers tend to be very difficult to work with as well. But these questions, like, uh, you know, the, the hardest ones are always the uh, downsizers, right? Them too, but, yeah. but these questions, there's not, you don't just ask them one way, one question in one particular format. Every, this is negotiating. This is pre prior to actually, you know, remember we said yesterday, you actually start negotiating with, a, your, with your buyer or seller when you originally meet with them because you're negotiating with understanding what the moving parts are going to be when you finally find, find a house for them. Kind of pre-negotiating in a way. Right. But you're going to have to ask some of these questions multiple ways, even if they've given you, well, you know, I would like, for example, uh, the seller who you're now trying to determine their motivation and they're telling you, well, you know what, we've got a place we're going to move to in Florida. If, you know, if we get our price and we get all the rest of it. I don't want you to accept that offer. I want you to actually start observing how they're living. Are things being boxed up? Is that so? That's fantastic. Where's the place you're moving in Florida? Well, it's in Tallahassee. Okay, great. So, you know, ask some questions. How big is that property? Well, it's 1,300 square feet and they're moving from a 30,000 square foot house. Do you guys get the little conflict there? So, they're not necessarily going to be moving into that property and they're not going to be that motivated. And if you need to know all these questions ahead of time so you can do your job, that's the importance of knowing how to pre qualify. Yes. So, this was all about the what you were talking about was pre-motivation, you know, are it really the question I do hear this a lot on coaching calls. Do you feel like you are more motivated for them to buy, especially with buyers than they are to actually buy? Now, some of this stems back to not having asked those questions in the first place and assuming that you find something that you think meets their criteria. Well, why aren't they buying it? Why aren't they jumping? Why aren't they even calling me back? Well, because you didn't ask that question on a scale of one to 10 and they were only a six or seven, you didn't find out how to close the gap, right? So maybe they seemed motivated when you met them at an open house, but because you didn't drill down on the questions, you don't really know where they are in their loan and they're ghosting you now, even though you've got a perfect house in your mind for them because they aren't actually through the loan process yet. And you blame the buyers. And so legally you guys do sell real estate, right? That's what it says on your real estate license. But the reality of it is, is the real estate sells itself. You're not going to talk a seller into selling that doesn't want to sell. And you're not going to talk a buyer into, and nor should you try, right? That's kind of slimy. Or nor are you going to try to talk a buyer into buying a house that they don't already want to buy. It just doesn't happen. And it causes a ton of stress for real estate agents. people, for agents. Well, inexperienced agents. Exactly. They think, they think that they're supposed to strong arm people into doing things they don't want to do. That's not selling real estate. Nope. At the end of the day, guys, what you really are is your well-paid interrupters. You're supposed to get into facilitators. The, well, I like interrupters. Interrupters, okay. well, because they're just merely getting in the way or getting in the middle and mm -hmm. facilitating what something that was going to happen anyway. That sure. seller was going to happen. It mm -hmm. was going to sell anyway. You're just supposed to essentially put yourself in the middle of that. Ideally, bring value so the process happens smoothly into the benefit of the seller. And that's what you're doing. You're not talking that. You're not going to talk an unmotivated seller into being motivated. You're not going to talk an unmotivated buyer into being motivated. Ain't going to happen. Yeah, see, this. I think that this is very symptomatic of a changing market. You know why? Because they didn't really have to do a whole lot of talking into in nope. the previous market. Because all the sellers were making tons of money and the buyers had enough to choose from. And the buyers were highly motivated to get that lower interest rate. Now you guys are, many of you are still assuming that that level of motivation is just out there when in fact, and we talked about this on previous podcasts, both yesterday and the day before, when in fact we're getting back to quote, normal situational reasons 
And one of the things, uh, I listen to the Housing Wire podcast. You guys should listen to Housing Wire as well. And you write for the Housing Wire? Yes. And one of the things that they say is we're getting back to a boring and balanced market. And to remember that people move, sellers sell, and buyers buy because of circumstances over interest rates, over market conditions, over even price. They move because they have something happen. Right. That is independent of the rest of the conversation. So if you're talking to everyone, assuming they all have the same motivation because the market was so frothy for so long, this is what's happening is agents are wondering why these people aren't calling them back. Why? I mean, I have 20 leads. But really, Julie, it's absolutely getting back to the sellers that have to sell. And well, here's a little shock for some of you. There's no such thing as a buyer that has to buy. Nope. And this is like real estate 101. So here it is. Uh, if you have a choice between working with buyers and sellers, you always choose sellers. You do have a choice, by the way. You just have to have more skill to work with sellers. Working with buyers is physical labor. Working with sellers is mental labor because there's no such thing as a buyer that has to buy. And some of you are discovering that the hard way. Mm -hmm. How many of you rolled into this year thinking you had this big, long list of buyers? And guess what? None of those buyers are actually in, remotely interested in doing a transaction because of you know interest rates or this or the other thing. And because you frankly don't know how to help them ex understand that what's happening with inflation and that now is probably going to be the best time for them to purchase a house, certainly in the next five, if not 10 years, because inflation is going to drive everything up. But you're discovering there's no such thing as a buyer that has to buy. Buyers can always stay put. They can stay renting. They can stay living in mom's basement. They can stay in their current home. But there are sellers, and always will be, always have been, that have to sell. Ha sellers that where they don't have a choice. It, the choice isn't viable. Uh, you know, the option is not it's viable. It's not up to them anymore. It, or or, or really? it is, but basically... Okay, it's a tax lien, or it's a relocation, or it's a property that they inherited, or there's another. They're closing on a new home, and they have to get rid of the other one. They can't afford the payment anymore. These are the judicial. Okay, how about this one? You know, maybe there's health reasons why they the bedroom can't be upstairs anymore. Maybe you guys get it. There are sellers out there that always have to sell. The option to sell is not really, it, they don't have an option other than to sell. And by the way, sellers don't have to qualify the same way buyers do. That's right. Okay, so a seller could just have no loan. There, there's no having to qualify other than something causing them to actually have to sell. This is why they have more value to you as a listing as a listing agent. But this always goes back to one of the chapters in our you know best selling book Harris Rules. Mm -hmm. uh, if you generate, i.e., leads, you do not have to tolerate, i.e., tolerate unmotivated people that never transact. So your goal is not just to generate a crap ton of leads. I know all of you can do that with pay per click and buying leads. That is not going to win the game. What's going to win the game is generating said lead, but then become incredibly efficient at pre-qualifying the lead as we've really been drilling down as we do every single day on this podcast so that you have not a lot of leads. Our top, Julie, here, I'll ask mm. you this question. So you're now coaching some amazing agents. Mm -hmm. What's And I know some of, a lot of them are uh, sort of, you know, licking their wounds as we enter into this new market, trying to understand the new rules of real estate, which mm -hmm. is what you and I preach on this podcast always mm -hmm. have. Not new for us, new nope. for everybody else. Sure. All right, so how many leads do you, like when it comes to leads, how many leads do you think your average uh, top producing agent should have at all times, maximum? Maximum 20, with most of them needing to be listing leads. So I would say uh, maybe 15 of those being listings. Some of them may be buying with them as well, but I would say no more than 20. So when you get somebody- or and have, That's for top producers. Have, have you shown, have a new coaching client shown up in your schedule in the last, say, month that has had a crap ton of uh, leads in their CRM that they're dripping on. Have you had that happen yet? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. And so what do you tell them to do with said dripping people? Well, they come in varying degrees of knowing, you know, who they're calling a lead, right? So some agents call everything a lead just because they're in the database. So That's not know. really a lead. Right. And others of them have come a, a bit more sophisticated where they can tell me what the buyer's situation is. So... The first job is to, if you're calling, if you're counting on them, you're calling them a lead. In, in fact, they are counting on you to do something for them. You need to either get them in contract or refer them or decide that you're not going to do any of those things. You have to drill down and see who is actually going to transact. In other words, you're telling no matter whether what sort of, you know, first of all, you don't want a lot of leads. A no. lot of leads, the problem is you have a lot of leads, even if they're in a CRM, is it creates a false sense of security 
which will make it so you're going to naturally become more complacent. Because they're not all going to transact. They're just nope. not. They're not really leads. They're just a list of people. So if you're one of those agents and you have a crap ton of leads, here's your goal. You got to understand a lead has no value. A pre-qualified lead, a pre-qualified motivated lead has value. Your mission isn't just to gather the lead and drip on the lead. Your lead, your mission is to call the lead, pre-qualify the lead, find that 10 or 15 number, you know, the number of leads. And then those are the folks you're going to work with. You have to call them and pre-qualify them. And hopefully now you're understanding the difference between a have to and a want to when it comes to the lead quality. These are things that are incredibly important, especially now. There are so many people that are going to waste your time, not to be malicious, but just because they don't know any better. That's and right. so many agents out there will buy a lead, will you know spend ridiculous amounts of time with said lead, only then to discover that the lead buyer, maybe even seller, wasn't really going to transact in the first place. That's right. So we're talking about negotiating and today's series is all about, or today's podcast is all about knowing the buyer. So point number two is how qualified is the buyer to actually buy the property? If they are all cash, where is the cash coming from? And are they not weird about proving that? If they're financed, call the lender and review the lender's letter. Are they pre-qualified, pre-approved, or loan committed? Do you know the difference between those three things? pre-qualified, pre-approved, or loan committed. What contingencies are there? Are they comfortable in the price range the lender has actually approved them for? What about the appraisal contingencies or waivers? Now, refer to the ultimate addendum if you're a premier coaching member because we have done podcasts about that and we have very specific coaching about this. The point is, number two, how qualified is the buyer to actually buy the property? Now, this comes into negotiation several ways. One of them is, Sometimes a buyer will try and talk their buyer's agent into coming in lower than what will be acceptable to the seller, not because they're trying to be a jerk, not because they're trying to beat the seller up, but because they actually are either only qualified to go lower than the list price, or they just aren't comfortable in that price range, even though the buyer's agent showed them that. Or frankly, they have a lot of misinformation about what's happening in the housing market. All of that. Yep. And remember, guys, you can join Premier Coaching right now for free. Just go to premiercoaching.com, premiercoaching.com. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or of course over on YouTube, there are links down in the show description. Click said link, join Premier Coaching, and then you will get more than just the overview of how to absolutely kick butt negotiating in this market. That's right. So here's the secret. Have the buyer's lender call the listing agent and vouch for their pre-approval or loan commitment. This has won many negotiations, sometimes even with a lower priced offer. I'm not talking about low ball, but less than going over list. And that's in a changing market. In any market, you should always have the lender call the listing agent and vouch for their loan commitment. Ideally loan commitment, but at least pre-approval. Okay, so here's another question. Knowing your buyer, point number three. How many homes do they have to choose from just like this one? Competing inventory can affect a buyer's interest level, time frame, and motivation. It can also affect the seller's willingness to negotiate. So know what's out there as an alternative to the subject property. This, if there's a lot to choose from, the buyer might be like, well, I mean, it meets most of my needs, but let's go look at 10 more properties. Well, again, this all goes back. I mean, most of these issues that come into negotiation, the problems happen because, frankly, you didn't pre-qualify that buyer to begin with and you didn't set realistic expectations when you started working with them. It's a classic newbie mistake. Yeah. And frankly, you know, we keep on grinding on this and hopefully you guys are really having this register with you. The past market, buyers were buying out of FOMO. And in many markets, that's fortunately still happening, right? Yes. They're buying and they weren't that particular. They were compromising left and they're compromising right. I mean, Julie and I are standing in our villa right now. <laughs> we, we were some of those buyers. Yeah, we were some of those buyers. Well, this came for sale, what, three years ago, whatever it was. Yeah. We definitely did not necessarily like this place. And now, frankly, after a lot of renovation, we're actually starting to really love this place. Finally. Yeah. But now if this, you know, nowadays the buyer's expectations have changed significantly here. That's right. That's yeah. right. And one of the reasons we did it is because back then there was almost nothing to choose from and we wanted a bigger house and all the things that we did get. So, but it is important to know how many homes they have to actually choose from because you can imagine, and we did this, you don't have to imagine, we actually did this. When we were advising sellers, they got an offer in, you know, how you speak with a seller when you know they're the only game in town and you've got a bunch of showings and you probably are going to get multiple offers versus you know, they're one of 20 listings in Oak Creek phase 45, where there's not just three other competing, but they're all the exact same model match. 
you know, that that's going to be a different type of conversation. And right? they're still building new homes. I think they are. Exactly. Yes. I'm sure there's Oak Creek, Denver. Oh, my goodness. Sub, you know, you're going to be lost in there for 122. weeks. 122, yep. Exactly. Well, guys, remember, it's simple for you to join Premier Coaching. Just go to premiercoaching.com, premiercoaching.com, or click the links in the show descriptions. And this is the type of information I think a lot of you realize that when you're listening to Julia on this podcast, we only have you for 20 to 30 minutes a day, right? But when you're listening, don't you just don't you find yourself feeling more motivated and confident because now you know how to help more people? That's because your skill set is getting stronger. And when your skill set gets stronger, what else improves? Your mindset. And then you're more than willing to go out there and help people. Don't work on your mindset first. Work on your skill set. Then your mindset naturally, organically improves. That's right. So back to knowing your buyer. Point number four, does the buyer have a contingency plan if this deal does not work out? Are they on a month-to-month lease? Are they living with friends or family? Those are some of the most motivated ones. They're, they're living in like their parents' basement and they just got married. That's well, great. But the most unmotivated ones are if they have a long-term lease and they're not willing to buy the lease out. That's right. And you didn't ask the question. They, wait, maybe they're ghosting you because they don't know how to tell you that and you've spent all this time with them. Okay, corporate housing provided by their employer. That might be an option. Living in an RV. What happens if they don't buy this one? And it's interesting how buyer's motivation to write an acceptable offer does change based on their situation. And the, Again, to your point, though, buyers don't always have to buy. Oftentimes, they don't. no buyer has to buy, so they have all these options. But if their leases run out and they, they haven't identified a new place to rent, they can't go month to month, they don't have any relatives to live with, and they don't have an RV laying around, well, they're probably going to come in a lot stronger on the house that they're in love with. And this, all this logic same applies to the seller side of things as well. Yes. So let's say, for example, a seller's worried about where they're going to move to once the property sells. There's nothing for sale that they like. Well, have you ever thought about taking that, you know, rent, you know, renting or leasing a coach, you know, a big ass RV for a year and driving around the country? Haven't you always dreamed of that, Mr. Seller? <laughs> or what about that property you were thinking about buying in Florida as your, you know, whatever, your getaway or all those types of things? Create alternative paths forward for the clients if there's not a ready if there's not a readily available, you know, move up for them or a next property for them. You're going to have to start thinking for them and they're going to be like, "Well, that's a great idea. I wonder why no other agent hmm. even suggested that." Hmm, how does that work? I know, you know, it's interesting about this. I think we did a podcast about this last summer. What are the options for when a seller says, "I would list with you" or maybe they already are listed but they won't accept a contract because they don't know where they're going? That is the end of the conversation for most agents, mm-hmm. and it shouldn't be. Even our most experienced agents don't take it far enough. They, we did a podcast about all of the different possibilities, a lease back, build and then sell, buy first and sell second, all of these different possibilities. So yes, this is all situation, and all of this goes into the negotiation mix. All right, so speaking of which, our final point for today If required to go over the list price, now you would know that by talking to the listing agent and knowing the market, and or guarantee an appraisal deficit, can the buyer actually handle those add-ons in addition to their down payment? Has that discussion actually happened? Lots of deals tank because they didn't actually do the math. Don't get your buyers in over their heads. If they can't handle the deficit, they may need to be in a lower price range or have you find a home that they won't compete for. One of my coaching clients last week, wrote two really strong offers. Why did they lose? In spite of going over the list price, they lost because they could not make up the appraisal deficit. They didn't have the cash to do both. We talked about that a lot yesterday. Yes, listen a lot. To, You listen to yesterday's show. So again, lots of information for you. Lots of you, I can tell by the feedback we're getting, are feeling grateful for all this information, but also are feeling a little overwhelmed. Move past the overwhelmed. You do not have to have you know, mastery of all this information. You do have to be exposed to what you don't know so that when you are in a, in a, you know, a situation where you are maybe going to lose the deal, but you've been exposed to a, essentially a solution from this podcast or certainly from our coaching, then you're at least going to be able to solve the problem and explain to the seller, well, you know, I have a plan, you know, and then go and Review your coaching material and premier coaching or listen to the podcast where you learned all this information. Don't be surprised at all that your office managers and your brokers and your team leaders don't have any of this information because they haven't been in real estate forever. They haven't sold in different markets. They haven't, you know, coached at the same level that we have. Oh, Julie, um, 
you had a, um, so I think there were seven or eight of you that responded to uh, my suggestion that some of you request to be in Julie's coaching schedule. I'm trying to say that as nicely as possible. Mm -hmm. And yes, the if you're interested in being Julie's coaching schedule, she is going, I, I am sifting and sorting on pre-qualifying and she's probably, or what, Julie, one maybe, honestly? Yes, for the right Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And she's looking for the right caliber of coaching clients. So if you are ready to really get your game on because of this market, you can text me directly at 512-758-0206. Um, but this is me pre-qualifying you just so you know, do text me information on you, how long you've been in real estate, um, you know, what your success rate's been. If you're new into real estate and you are not, you know, financially viable yet as an entrepreneur, Julie's not going to be the coach for you, but we do have coaching programs that are perfect for you. That's, That's what right. Premier Coaching is for. So I'm just letting you know. But if those of you who have been successful in the past and you want to be successful in the future, you've had a taste of what it means to really be successful in real estate and you want to get your game on, those are the people that Julie loves in her schedule. Yes, that's right. So even, you know, of course, we're going to pre-qualify each other and make sure we're a good match. But even if you're not somebody for my schedule, that doesn't mean that you're not right for coaching. We will help you find the right program. We have several different levels underneath the elite coaching that Tim and I do. Yeah, that's right. Ooh, me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Perhaps. maybe maybe me, right? <laughs> All right. So guys, thank, uh, thank you, uh, you know, from the bottom of our hearts uh, for eternity, for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. I love seeing that we're picking up uh, listeners all over the world. It's pretty, yes. it's awesome. Big actually. shout out to our international crowd. Yes, it's incredible. So guys, if... Um, like if you've not yet done so, because it is still our birthday month. Birthday month. Yes. As, we, as we've been begging and pleading for the last you know week, uh, you know you didn't get us anything for our birthdays. And listen, we're not going to be offended. We forgive you, provided you give us a five star review on iTunes That's right. and a piffy comment. But someone asked what piffy meant. Yeah. Something where you're actually being yourself, talking about your experience, what you've learned, how you benefited from the podcast. Something specific. Yeah, that's those are the types of um, reviews that people love. But we would really sincerely appreciate that. It means the world to us. It really, really does. It tells us that we're on target. This topic this week was as a result of some of the comments mm -hmm. that you guys were leaving and the feedback we get. We listen. We pay attention, not only to you know coaching clients, but also to all of our podcast listeners because there are tens of thousands of you that listen to us every single day. So thank you for continuing to keep this the number one listen to daily podcast in at least the United States. Listen, part four of this topic is tomorrow. We know you've been loving this topic. Do continue to share our podcast with as many other real estate professionals as you can think of. And guys, listen, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're going to love that one.